Today we tackle the infamous Gaussian Interval. This interval shows up in probability and statistics and so many applications, and in fact, I've even done a video on this interval already. But in this video, I want to show you a pretty cool and different technique to be able to evaluate the Gaussian Interval. I can use Maple Learn, which is the sponsor of today's video, just to quickly plot the Gaussian. So we're basically investigating what is the area under this curve. The way my trick begins is to try and parameterize this interval. What I mean by that is I'm going to construct a function of t, f of t, where instead of going from 0 to infinity, I go from 0 to t. There's now this parameter t in the upper limit of the integral. I've talked about this trick of taking an integral and parameterizing it before, sometimes known as Feynman's technique, and we saw this in a previous video, for example, on the integral of the sinc function. And I also want to note that the f of t is this integral squared. We'll see in just a little bit how the squared is going to come along and be useful for us. But for now, I just want to note that the original problem we were posed with is nothing but the square root of this function in the limit as t goes to infinity. Okay, so now let's stick around with this f of t and see how we can manipulate it. The first thing I'm going to do is try and take the derivative of my f of t with respect to t. It looks something like this. What I've done is the chain rule. When I look at the f of t, I think of this as an inside function squared. So the derivative of the outside function is just twice the function and then I multiply by the derivative of the inside function. That the f of t was this integral squared was sort of done such that the integral is retained when I take the derivative that I, I get the integral as well as something else. That's why I chose this f of t. Okay, so now if I look at that inside portion, the derivative with respect to t of this integral, I can solve this very easily by the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says, when you take the derivative of an accumulation function like this, zero up to a variable, the derivative and the integral in a sense cancels. But what it really means is you just take the integrand and anywhere there's an x, you replace it with a t. So this is just going to simplify to be e to the minus t squared. I still have an integral, but my integral is with respect to x. So e to the minus t squared is just a constant. I can move that inside the integral. And thus, I claim my derivative of f is this. Now, when I look at this expression, one of the things that's challenging about it is precisely the thing that I introduced, that there's this variable t in the limit of integration. So let me do a change of variables to make my limits of integration just numbers again, and that'll put the t entirely in terms of the integrand, so it's all in one place. So for example, something like this. A new variable y is x divided by t. So I then take dx, this is t dy. And this was useful because when I plug in that change of variables, instead of an integral from 0 to t, I get this integral from 0 up to 1. And sort of the effect of that is now my integrand has this multiplication by t as well. Okay, in my exponent here, the t squared appears twice, so I may as well pull that out. And this is the expression that I have now gotten, something where the entire mess to do with t's is all in the integrand. Now, I still don't know how to integrate this function. Note the t doesn't help us to do like a u substitution because I'm doing an integral with respect to y. So ignoring the t parts, which are constants, it's just sort of like an e to the minus y squared, which, you know, that's what we had at the beginning. We haven't helped ourselves. Often when you're playing around with an integral like this, the real goal is to massage it and do manipulations until you can use elementary techniques to be able to integrate it. However, I do have one clue, which was that I remember that this computation was the derivative of f with respect to t. So if I can get some derivatives with respect to t cancelling, maybe that would be helpful because I'd have a derivative with respect to t on both sides of the equation. And indeed, this trick works. Is that I could rewrite this as a derivative. That is, okay, as integral from 0 to 1. And it's a partial derivative because my integrand has t and y in it, so I'm observing that it's a derivative with respect to t. So I write the partial derivative with respect to t. And indeed, if you took that partial derivative, a y squared plus 1 would come out the bottom and cancel that denominator, and likewise the minus signs would cancel and you pick up the extra 2. There are no problem spots in this integral on the domain 0 to 1. I can absolutely take that derivative with respect to t and pull it to the outside of my integral. Okay, minor pedantic note, when I pull it outside of the integral, I change it from being partial derivatives to a full derivative. 
The, the argument here is just that my integral was an integral respect to y. That eliminates the y variable, so everything that remains is just a function of t, and I'm taking the derivative of that single variable function of t. Minor note. Okay, so where are we at? We did introduce this function f. We took its derivative and we got that it was this. So let me equate those two things. I said the derivative of f with respect to t is equal to this. Well, if I have the derivatives being equal on both sides, why don't I just come along and integrate? f of t is just, well, I get rid of the derivative, but I have to add a plus c. So up to this constant, I now know what this f of t is. I could take the limit of this as t goes to infinity, and I'd get my answer. Except what's the constant? Now, this is what we've derived. This is what we've computed that f of t is equal to this. But remember, we also defined it something at the beginning. So if I go back to the beginning, f of t was defined this way. It was the square of this particular integral. I can thus equate the two of them. And actually, the bottom one, I can compute this for one value of t really nicely. Most of those I don't know. But for the value of t equal to zero, I know what the bottom is. The integral from zero to zero is going to be zero. So let's do this. Let's take the limit as t goes to zero on both sides. And for the bottom, I know exactly what it's going to be. This is nothing but zero. Okay, what about the top? I've got that plus c, but what's the other big mess? And let's just turn to maple learn very quickly to get an understanding of this integrand. For any specific value of t, the broad shape of this function kind of looks analogous to a Gaussian as well. If I'm sending t going to zero, the exponential becomes just one, and so this just looks like one over y squared plus one. And then because in a moment we're gonna have to take the limit as t goes to infinity as well, let's just explore that. If I increase the value of t, basically the e to the negative t squared just drags down the entire integrand. So as I increase the value of t, the whole thing goes to zero. On the bounded interval with y between zero and one, there's no problem spots, no like zeros in the denominator that are gonna blow up. And this type of convergence is actually uniform convergence. And this is important for us because it satisfies the technical conditions under which we're allowed to interchange the limit and the integral side. So back to our integral, we've seen that we can turn the limit as t goes to zero to just one over y squared plus one. And this, I know, this is arctan. Specifically, it's arctan of the upper limit one minus arctan of the lower limit zero plus c. And plug in that arctangent of one is gonna give me this value of pi over four uh, minus zero plus c. Final answer is that our c is equal to pi over four. I quite like this trick of having my function represented in two different ways and then I'm able to compute what the c was because it turned out that at zero, I could do both sides of the integrand really easily. All right, so summarizing where we are at. We decided that our f of t was this big long integral plus a constant, but now we know the constant is pi over four. We're making a lot of progress. Now, let's remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to compute the limit as t goes to infinity, that the value of f at infinity, or at least its square root, is going to be our final answer. Now, we'd already studied this integrand in Maple Learn early in the video, and we've seen how as t goes to infinity, this uniformly just goes down to zero, and, and so this entire integral is just zero. And so, since where we had begun was that the Gaussian integral from zero to infinity e to the minus x squared dx was just the square root of this particular value, I can finally conclude that the integral is nothing but root pi divided by two. Now, throughout this video, I have been using the software behind me, which is MapleLearn, and my thank you to Maple for sponsoring this video. MapleLearn is extremely powerful for helping you to do a lot of mathematics on the fly. If I just write a function like, I don't know, e to the x cosine of x, MapleLearn interprets what I've entered and gives me a contextual menu of types of computations I might want to do. I might want to take its derivative, I might want to take its integral, I might want to take its Taylor series. You can even go and get sort of step-by-step -step solutions of how the Maple engine is going through and doing these computations so that you can follow along. If instead I put something in like a matrix, the list of options that I can compute are going to change based on the context of a matrix. I can plot things in two and three dimensions, and I can compile everything into these very nice, wonderful documents. So I'm a big fan of using Maple Learn. I encourage you to check it out at the link down in the description. With that said, I hope you enjoyed the video, and we'll do some more math in the next one.